Good evening and welcome to tonight's show here on DJ and TV. We are broadcasting Facebook, YouTube. If you're watching it on Monday night, if you're watching it on a different night of the week, well, you know, it's going out wherever it's going out later in the week. That's just how it works. So tonight I have got a couple of guests with us for tonight's topic. We've got Mike Lenstra, who is, let's see, to my right. Good evening, Mike. Hello. And then down in the bottom, keeping the basement warm, is Bill Herman. It's me. It is. It's so great to have you guys with us tonight. It's nice to be here. Yeah. Tonight, we're going to talk sales because for a lot of us, we've been functioning and we've been able to do things and it's and life has kind of continued. But there has been some changes in that sales realm. And for others, in our situation up here in Minnesota, there really hasn't been much for sales calls going on. And now, as things are starting to look more positive, people are starting to you know come out of their shell a little bit. And we're going to have kind of a discussion tonight about how things have changed, how things are similar, and really hopefully get your mind ready to go as these calls start to come in and, and help to make you more successful in communicating with today's clients that are calling. So I've been keeping really, really my, my sales chops by just selling so a lot of my personal items. <laughs> yeah, it looks it. I looks it. I mean that that office is way empty. Facebook Marketplace is, you know, taking on some of my old gear. Yeah, that's <laughs> it's great. This is this yeah, and you know something John, it's it's a good topic, really. That because you're right. I mean, we 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 we're about to start getting calls or you might have already started to get calls. And you think, you know, what did I do before? Or, 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 or worse yet, you've got into a place of, 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 of feeling like there's not enough work. You start feeling, you start feeling desperate, mm -hmm. you know, and then that desperation, uh, it's, it, it stinks, you know, people smell it coming, you know, and then you end up falling into pitch mode and, and, uh, and then every, every call that you talk to, every person you talk to, they kind of feel the desperation on you because it's been a while it and has. because we've had an entire year of the world telling us that, yeah, you know, eh, things are different now. You know, you might not go back to work every time you turn around, you're, you know, you, you have this terrified thought that this might be it. So the years and years of shaking that it only took for some people these last 12 months for it to creep back in in a, in a much bigger way than it was before we've conquered it. For sure. And, and what uh, Bill, Bill's referring to, of course, is taking us back into the early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s, when our, our good friend Mark Farrell came on and started talking about commanding a a professional fee for our service. And he brought that, uh, that discussion to the mobile DJ industry. I, I've seen some of that. Uh, that's for sure, uh, Mike. Let's let's jump over because now you're in Iowa and you've been. Yes. You guys have been pretty open. Or I don't want to say yeah. pretty open, but there yeah. have been consistent some consistency on events. Yeah. Kind of for those who are not familiar with, how have things changed uh, from you know last year when things went crazy to where we are today for you? Well, we were probably one of the first states to start to open up, and uh, again, I think it was March 13th, March 15th when they originally started the stop the you know two weeks stop to stop the spread well we know that lasted a whole lot longer than two weeks but our state actually began to open up in may and i ironically i our first wedding of the year was for a state representative over the memorial day weekend and we followed that i think that the the next wedding after that was like june 19th and then we i think we did like 20 weddings and then the cases begin to go up as the weather started to get colder. And then they kind of put the, the brakes on everything again in November. So I made kind of a stretch there from probably, again, June 19th until Thanksgiving weekend that we had, you know, almost a steady stream of weddings. And then we were kind of kicked to the back of the bus again. And now it's all the way out till April before I see anything again. But, uh, again, we... I guess, I don't know if you want to say ahead of the times, but a little bit more aggressive that uh, the governor here in the state of Iowa has dropped the state mandate and we're starting to see almost maybe people get too comfortable. Um, not as many people wearing masks, um, starting to maybe crowd the restaurants a little bit more and such like that. So it's, it's starting to see a comeback here. And with that, of course, some of the, the calls then too. So let's let's talk about the the call in traffic from my from my perspective or my my uh, usually in the summer I get a couple of calls a week or a couple of contacts a week. 
complete ghost town. Uh, there wasn't really anything. And then I get into fall and there's kind of this November, December kind of inquiry booking season. Then there's the January. Mm -hmm. And then after you get to about the first of March, it's, it's done for the season beyond, you know, a couple of uh, here and there. Yeah. How has, how did your 2020 in with Iowa being in the state the situation you were, how did your calls and your flow differ? Yeah, um, it definitely, it definitely changed it. There were, Still getting some calls, but along with the always price question was the, and what is your cancellation policy? Mm -hmm. Because, of course, there were stories out there, not only our industry, but many others that there was the no cancellation policy. And there were a lot of couples that felt they got taken to the cleaners and they weren't getting their retainer or deposit back. But that became... That became more of an issue than it ever has been previously. Was the call volume similar in the fall for you as in past years, or was it down? No, no. The, there was really, there was really very few calls at all in the fall of the year at all. I didn't really start seeing calls here again until, uh, well, actually, it was a little bit before Christmas, John. And I think part of that was that some of these couples that did get engaged over the fall and were kind of maybe a little bit apprehensive began to look at some of the banquet halls and found out that so many of them were already booked up from the postponements of 20 that had moved over to 21. And then they got a little like, we better get on this a little quicker. And, uh, and again, it was probably actually before Christmas, I probably got more calls uh, this, I guess season you'd say before Christmas than I did post holidays, which is kind of unusual. Very unusual with that. So our call mm -hmm. definitely, definitely had an effect on that. Um, Bill, what, what is your kind of your, your time of, of your, your prime booking season? Well, you know, as, as a, as a single operator and the person who takes most of his work off of, uh, off of referral, you know, I went an entire year without doing anything. Mm -hmm. You know, if I do an event, I'll get several calls from every event, uh, because they just saw me and they know somebody who's, who's getting married or they were there and they were thinking about me and getting married. And because we haven't done a whole lot of stuff. I haven't done a lot of stuff. There's been not a lot of calls. Now, for this upcoming year, I've got, you know, nine, I think, um, with some other people that I'll be meeting with in a couple of weeks. But um, uh, it is it is the uncertainty. Mike uh, talked about it a little bit. It's, you know, and I remember the uncertainty of 9-11. Uh, of, of you mm -hmm. know, everybody's, I you know, the, the world is coming to an end. I'm not certain of what's happening tomorrow. So people... Went. I mean, I remember back then, you know, people were booking me two, three years out. Then it went down to a year out. Then it went down to eight months out. Or right now, I just got a booking for July because they waited that long. Mm -hmm. um, and they're still unsure. They're like rolling the dice. Yeah. On, well, I'm hopefully in July, right? I've got two things in June or the two things that are going to come up on, on me. And that will depend on the uncertain. Even the client is uncertain of what might happen right? What, what weird turn we're going to have. So the un uncertainty is, is, is what has them asking the questions about, about the uh, cancellation policies. But even that, I think that has become yet another one of those things that our colleagues and the people in the wedding industry or the event industry are telling clients to ask about. Mm -hmm. It's very much, it's almost like, remember, I don't know if you remember back in the 2000s when they started, everybody was writing articles on how, what questions to Ten ask your questions DJ. to ask your DJ. Well, this has become that because I, I've had a few people ask, you know, what's your cancellation policy? And, and before I give them an answer, I want to, I say, well, wh wh what are you worried about? What, what are you? And honestly, the few people that have told, they went, well, it's kind of, you know, we're not sure what's going on. So we're not, somebody probably kind of told us that we should probably ask. I'm like, well, you know, and it's different, right? I mean, I know big companies, they've got a very hard-lined uh, policy. Whereas for me, I have to look at them and say, well, you know, we'll look at the cancellation when it comes up. I mean, as of right now, I can tell them in my contract that says, you know, it's hard-lined. Mm -hmm. But because I'm a single operator, somebody calls to cancel, I'm having a conversation about why they're canceling, what they're expecting from me. And then we talk about, you know, how it's impacting them, but also how it's impacting me because I've created a relationship that maybe a big company has it. So this uncertainty has everybody sh shy on everything. 
Um, normally, you know, if, if I spend the kind of time necessary to connect with these people before they buy, then, then I've alleviated a lot of the uncertainty because they know that I'm as, as in on trying to make this happen as they are. I really see and understand their worries and concerns. I have wiggle room that some big companies that are doing a lot of volume don't. You know, it's like, you know, you have problems, we're going to work it out. As opposed to, you know, let me just, I'm going to send you my policy book. And when, when, when problems arise, you and I are going to, I'm just going to send you the policy book. A circle of policy that answers that one question. Uh, and that's what they're worried about. With me, and I, they hear from me, it's like, well, you know, every problem has a solution. And it might be yours, it might not be somebody else's. So when they start to realize that I am, <clears throat> when I am, when I'm in for what they're trying to do, using my tools to help for what they really want and the feelings and the worries and the concerns I'm doing. There isn't like, this is the things I do and that's it. It's like, I'm going to do whatever it takes for you. I'm going to do whatever it takes for this person. For that person, it's not going to be as much because they don't need as much, whereas another person might need more. So policy-wise, I that conversation has to be about, well, you know, we're going to like each other and you're going to trust me and I'm going to trust you and we're going to work out whatever comes up. But that is a, that is a question and it's become a question because people are telling them to make the questions. Mm -hmm. Plus, you know, the stories that are out there about these, these terrible vendors that are taking advantage of the brides and grooms. Okay. I I'll bet you a thousand dollars. There's been very few of those, but they make really splashy headlines. Oh, for sure. Right. And then before uh, a vendor can do whatever is necessary for that bride or groom that's upset, they run off to the news, they scream, the news goes, that's going to make some great news story. And then they, then they make it about the whole, the whole, all of us are this way. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something to talk about too. I, that's something that when they, when they bring it up, I'm like, well, you know, if, if, you, if you do some looking, you're going to find that there's not that many articles. It's, it's like when they were talking about these these weddings that uh, <laughs> these these uh, the four hundred person wedding and and uh, three hundred of them walked away with COVID. Okay, well that happened in Bangladesh, yeah, but it didn't necessarily happen in every state of the union yeah, in exactly. every wedding over the last six weeks. Mm -hmm. It happened and it was terrible, but you know most vendors are going to be a lot easier and smarter and do the right things than what happened at that wedding. You know, in 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 Rochester, New York, or Minnesota, where they had a lot of people, and then there was a big story that a lot of them got COVID, but maybe only a few of them did. Right? It's this whole thing has got people so terrified that they're trying to hedge their bets, and what they're finding is they can't. The and 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 that's another conversation I'm having with my my couples, like in June. It's like I know you're trying to hedge your bets, but you're either all in or you're not. Mm -hmm. I would rather them not. I mean, right now, I've, I've, I, I talk to them every couple of weeks with these two June things that are coming up. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, so guys, I want to know that you're still in. You know, I, I don't want you to think, I, I, you know, I'd rather you not hedge your bets. You're either in or you're not. And if you're going to be not, we should probably decide sooner than June 1st for a June 24th wedding. Mm -hmm. Right? Because that's going to be better on them. It's going to be better on me. And it's, it's the more chances they're going to move it than it is that they're going to cancel it. So the way we do business has changed, certainly. And I'm not sure that when all of this is said and done and everybody has their, everybody has their, their, their shot and we're a year afterwards, that this isn't still going to be this. It's, it's been a year of training people to, to, to be a certain kind of a customer now. And that's where I really want to go next is that certain kind of a customer. We become this person who likes to research at home, click to find and communicate and to buy basically from a screen. And right. Mike, you were talking a little bit about that before we went on air and you've been, yes. you've been seeing that. Uh, so, so for someone who's hasn't had that, uh, what are you noticing when it comes to the, the Amazon type clicking purchase? Uh, that is the way that, uh, you know, our, our 30 and under crowd, which is the majority of our demographic that is the way that they purchase. And because they can buy a coat, they can buy a stereo, whatever they want, a few clicks away and be satisfied with it. That is what I've found out in the last 
maybe even before the pandemic, that's the trend now. And trying to get that customer, what's the word that I keep popping up that you're getting ghosted, that people will send <laughs> yeah. you an email and then you'll respond and you'll just not hear and you'll follow up right. with people's emails. But that that's definitely the trend now. Uh, you know, it seems to be one of the two things is you're either getting ghosted or they're like, yeah, right, sounds good. Where do I send my deposit to? And I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> you're, you're, you're jumping ahead here a little bit. I mean, I'm sure there's many of us. I mean, there's people that I've met with that I've had a conversation with that I thought, this isn't for me. This isn't the right fit. I mean, when I finally had a chance to talk with someone and found out they want an eight-hour wedding reception full of five-finger death punch and Gucci Mane with all kinds of special effects at their wedding, I'm not their guy. And so... I, I have to say, I did take the downtime just to really examine that and go, okay, I need to change my approach. What can, what can I do different to make a connection with these people like it used to be when I got to meet them face-to-face? -face? Uh, obviously, uh, things like this, Zoom has been a big thing. I mean, if I had to compare my last... 25 customers and how many I actually could get to meet with me face to face. And of course that's probably somewhat because of the pandemic um, or meet with me virtually. It's, it's been way more virtually, but I really think that was getting to be the trend before the whole pandemic began. Bill, um, much of your sales, as you mentioned, was referrals. Um, a lot of it is, uh, and I've, I've jotted some words down. You mentioned, uh, you know, having conversations, building relationships, so you can develop an understanding. Uh, I just summarized your la that last ten minute speech, by the way, for you. Out there. I knew you were going to go there. Uh, but the thing is, is that it, what Mike is seeing is, I think, what a lot of us are seeing is that we're we've raised a generation. I say we as a society, and we're part of that uh, click and buy generation from Amazon. It's like click buy. Oh, it'll be here tomorrow. Woo! Um, and some of that will spill over. We're seeing it in car sales. Uh, when we, we uh, were at a, a car dealership friend, and he's saying, I've got people who are buying vehicles that have ne I've never seen. They call. They look at. They have me walk around with a little FaceTime. They send me a check, and then we drive it down to them. How do you, you're working with that type of uh, a person who's used to that type of world now or getting more used to it. How can you make that connection and – get that so you can spend that time to get to know them well i think p p for me part of it is just uh, knowing <clears throat> excuse me that there's that there is a there is a, a way that i'll do it as well i mean i know what they want right i mean they they think that they know what they're buying okay and if unless you're an automotive geek and you know a lot about cars Buying something with a telephone call or with an email is not necessarily the best way to go. Any, any guys that are buying things at, at auctions, they're going to want to kick the tires and look under the hood to find out they're not being lied to. And even, even though, like, if they're, if you get your car dealer guy that's doing a FaceTime and walking around, at least that's, that is something. Okay. I can, I can see their eyes. They can see mine. We can read each other. Uh, I can see the, the, the verbal and the nonverbal cues because there's a face, right? right? This isn't my favorite thing, but it's a pretty close second, really. I mean, I like, I like the closeness of two human beings near each other. I like to be able to be in the space with them. I like that. Now, can I do it without as long as we have this? Yeah. Can I do it on the phone? Yeah, but it's still... I'm missing out on the verbal cues. I'm missing out whether or not I'm boring them, right? Or right. whether they've like, I've heard enough, you know, can you move on? Stuff like that. That's, those are things that are necessary, right? And thanks, John. I appreciate just, that. I wanted to but, just, uh, you know, I'm giving. <laughs> when, it, when, it, when it comes to what I'm doing, it's, you know, I know that, you know, even I've got kids. They want to do everything via the, the texting. Mm -hmm. Okay, and and they're buying things like you know, sandwiches, and to be delivered, right? And they're going to Amazon and buying stuff, right? But they haven't really gone and tried to buy a thing like this yet. And even they, there's a bit of them that understands that this is not this. Naughty, naughty, naughty. It's not a toy that you can go and buy, right? 
it's it then they know that it'll show up made the same way every single time it's it's this is a personality they're going to put in front of people and it doesn't take much to be able to make sure that 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 is reiterated in their mind because they're already thinking about it so now if in fact and i'll come right on and say look if you're looking to buy this uh, on a on a text uh, uh, uh and or an email <clears throat> there are people that you know that are doing that there's lots of DJs that are doing that. So you're kind of picking out of a large group. And, and, but what hasn't changed really is that these people think they know what a DJ is the same way that people in the 70s knew what a DJ was. They saw one, they knew what they were, right? And no one could tell them any different. And they were right until they saw something other than what they've seen. So why wouldn't they just find a picture of someone that doesn't offend them? right? And know that every DJ is the same. And so I'll just pick the one that's the cheapest. It may be a little harder, or it might seem like a little harder, but I, I was, it wasn't a whole lot tougher for me when I said to people that wanted to, to, to get in, send me an email or a phone call, how much are you and are you available? Okay. That's, they ask those two questions because we've taught them to ask those two questions. And because that's all they know, the only thing that they can figure out in their brain uh, about what they might think they know a little bit about how to compare DJs, how much they are and whether they're available. That's it. That's all they know. So now I have to say to them, uh, I don't tell my price and, and I am available, but I will meet you. And if you'd like to, great. Well, that's really not what I'm doing. I said, I get that's not what you're doing. And I, and I respect that. Um, but I have something unique. <laughs> and if you want to talk, we can talk. Now, a lot of, I think, that, that works that way for me is that I'm just, I just, I am unwilling to do a thing for them that I know is not good for them, right? I mean, if I knew that they could make good decisions on a DJ, buying a DJ the way they want to, I wouldn't have a problem with that. Mm -hmm. But you know, I know, every DJ in the world knows that all they're going to, if all they're doing is that, then we really don't have to be the thing that Mike is trying to create or I'm trying to create. We should probably just back everything off and get the same gear as everybody else and put ourselves into a shopping, uh, uh, a shopping place and put ourselves pennies less than the next guy and make our pictures prettier. So it becomes this attractive thing and that's a way to do it. But those guys, that's getting that, that's not creating anything. And that's, uh, that's that's all about uh, tons of volume, tons of volume. There is a business plan for that, and those people will show up the way the customer is expecting. Right? We expect you to have a website that we can take a picture and we can click buy. Well, I know there's a customer out there that if I don't bother them about it, that's what they're looking for. I'll just show up the way they say they want us to, as opposed to we can we can decide if we all got together as DJs and said. That's not how you get to hire DJs. I know that you've all done this. They would adjust to us because they still want DJs, mm -hmm. right? Now, because, and I, once again, I know that I'm weird in the world because there are guys with big companies, right? Or they have the, a full-time job and they're doing this part-time and how much effort do I want to put into this? I'm trying to systemize this. Okay, I got it. That's not a problem. But from my perspective... From my single operator perspective, when I'm, when I'm going to be charging a whole lot more money than those guys that are buy and click, I need them to get that this is a different experience from the moment they meet me. And yeah. I don't have a problem telling them, Could, I know I what you're looking for, but yeah. I'm a different thing. And if you want it, great. But I'm also not going to fight with them and tell them they're wrong. They're just wrong getting me that way. Sure. Mikey, you know, I steal you know, this that makes any sense. Here, yeah, could, could, I, could, I, could I just steal this for a second? I just yeah, this might be going a different direction and take me in the pants and send me a different direction if I do. But yeah, I know that you had mentioned Bill that, and this might be the journalist coming out of me now. But um, you had mentioned about you know so many of um, your events are pretty much referrals, whether that be from you know other weddings that you've done, people that have seen you, other maybe wedding professionals that you work with that you re you uh, re refer you. Mm -hmm. Do you think that we have to somehow educate not only our customers, but also others in our own wedding industry, what it is that we do? Because 
I've had a couple instances here recently where we have a, like a wedding um, professional group, I guess you'd say, here in the area. We all get together and drink beer and, and you know, trade stories, whatnot. Well, our main speaker here just recently was someone that's owned a bridal shop for like 33 years. Did a great job. And myself and another DJ approached her afterwards and like, well, let's let's talk to her. Let's see maybe what's trending. I mean, we asked her. We said, what? You know, what, what do you think that we should be wearing coming up here in the wedding season? And I'm thinking she's going to tell us, like, I don't know, Windsor ties are in, bow ties are in, here's the colors or whatever, something. And she said, her and her daughter looked and said, well, I would say if you just wore a nice pair of jeans and a, you know, a, a polo shirt with your company name, that would, that would be good. And, of course, we just looked at one another. And, it you know, it, it dawned on me right then. This this person's been in the wedding industry for 30 some years. She doesn't know what we do. And well, no, that's not true, though, Mike. She knows exactly what we do because we've seen she is that she said that because that's what she's seen. OK, right. I mean, she's been in the business. She's seen DJs. And the truth is that they're the, the most DJs are what you just uh, wear, what you described. Right. At least over the last 30 years, certainly mm -hmm. it hasn't been. Uh, for I mean, I was wearing a tuxedo well before anybody else was because I was trying to be different, okay? And because it made me feel more elegant and put to, to forth a more elegant way. It's all the decisions I made to be able to do a thing. Now, I still have professionals that have been around forever that see me wear a tuxedo and go, wow, you're wearing a tuxedo? Well, heck, you know, I've been wearing a tuxedo for over 30 years. You mean other guys don't wear tuxedos? That's what I was saying for the first 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not, I'm the only one. Well, now I'm learning that even after, in, in the last year, I'm finding out that people that are doing the kind of things that you and I talk about are rare. A lot of people say they do it. And then they show up in jeans and, and, and a polo shirt. And then they show up and do the same thing that everybody does all the time, even though they say they don't. Mm -hmm. Because that's just that kind of what it, what it is. And I know that because the question you really should have asked her was, um, what do you think of DJs? <laughs> that's really the question that's going to change DJs and how they show up. Go to those vendors and say, so describe to me a wedding DJ. What he looks like, what he smells like, uh, what he wears, the gear he has, the things he does. He does. Tell <laughs> me the last five DJs. Tell me what you saw. And I know you've asked this question kind of, we all have kind of kind of done it uh, backhandedly because mm -hmm. we have we hear the same the same answers. And the number one is well, he sits behind a table with his laptop and his head down, and he ignores people, and he plays whatever music he wants, and we never hear from him because he, he doesn't talk to Mike unless he says come out to the dance floor. That's pretty much the DJ. There. That's the DJ. That's what I see. That's what DJs are. I mean, literally, that's what people are saying now. That's what DJs are. So guys that are doing something other than that, that's the majority, which not me of insulting DJs. What I'm saying is th what that should tell people is there's an opportunity here to do anything but that <laughs> and make them go, oh my gosh, he showed up early. <laughs> oh my gosh, he asked me what I thought. When I go in and I, the florist is putting out stuff and I'm asking the florist, so tell me about the flowers and why the bride and groom picked those and, and a little bit about, you know, are they in season things? Like, Cause if I can mention that it's great if I can, but just because I'm asking to be able to know more about how they've now I'm already different. We still got guys that are showing up during happy hour to, to set up, right? We still got guys that are, that are, uh, eating, drinking, smoking. If you still can smoke, depending on what state you live in. You know, they're still doing those things because that's what most DJs do. Anybody who gets to our age, there's very few of us anyway. I don't know about you, Mike, but I didn't start out being the professional DJ I am. Really? <laughs> okay, I was the guy who did this for chicks and girls and wore jeans and a, 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 an old tuxedo shirt that I didn't wash last week and a cummerbund that maybe looked like it covered my gut and a clip-on tie with ruffles on a dirty shirt with too loud of equipment. And I was there to look impressive, be cool, meet girls and drink beer. And I did that for a long time. And then those guys that either, they either stopped doing that and do something else, 
which is a very few of them, or they stop doing it. So for the first, did you, did most DJs between the ages of 16 to 25 to 27, that's those guys. And most of the DJs are being seen. That's the way they're being seen. So what do you think of what I do? They don't know. But what do you think of DJs in general creates a, an opportunity to now to show up in a different way? And another reason I think that more people don't ghost me is because I show up in a way they're not expecting, right? I don't just answer their question the way they want it to. I don't just do it the way they think everybody does, or I'm not showing up the way every DJ they've talked to. If I show up differently, they go, well, this might be worth some time because I'm asking for it. I'm not just saying, well, I know that you're a millennial or what are they? Is it still millennial or is it something else now? Gen X, it's, yeah, Gen Z. I'm, the Gen I'm Z, the now. Gen... You know, the, 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 it's, it's my daughters. They're awful little people. So, <laughs> it's, <laughs> but it's, 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 they have the thing they want because they feel the way they feel because of the entitlement or whatever's going on in the world that they've lived in. Okay. And I can either pretend that I understand your world and try to show up in a way that's going to serve you the way you think I should, which isn't correct. You know, it isn't. You can't serve them that they why they want to be, want to be served. They're not going to be happy. Or you can just say, "This is the way I do it because you're going to get a better way." Now I'll tell you more. Come on over. If you don't, and you really think you know what DJs are, honestly, you are you're right. You'll find one of those guys that you think you need to. <laughs> <laughs> you think you need to micromanage because they're all awful. You're going to have to give a DJ list to off your Spotify and make them play it word for word, song for song, because they, you know, if you don't, you have to be in control. You think those guys exist? Okay, you can find but them. Unfortunately, guys. there are DJs out there that are more than happy to do that, Bill. Right, exactly. They're, They're showing up the way they think the customer wants as opposed to showing the customers there's something else. There's an opportunity to show up in a new way. And and and, and most uh, most of them are not going to be offended because we say to them, you don't know. Some of them might go, I don't care what you think. I know better than you. My, my teenagers mm -hmm. do that to me on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. But most of them, I don't think are going to do that. Most of them are looking to see because they don't know what they're doing. They're just trying to pretend like they do. I got a, I got a couple I'm meeting next week. They're, one of them is 92 and the other one's 82. They've just, they, they're two, they're, they're two widowers that have found each other. It's going to be a really fabulous wedding. And mm -hmm. they, Still, they are thinking the same way. They've seen enough DJs to tell me that DJs are awful, right? So here's an opportunity, even like the, even like they're millennials, for me to go and say, okay, I know what you think, and you're right because that's all you've ever seen. So as long as you know your your experience of it is this, then of course that's what it is. Now let me tell you something else, right? It's just it is what it is, and it's our. I think it's our choice. As long as we put the choice over there and say we have to show up the way they want, then we are constantly having this conversation because we were having this conversation, John, back in 1999. Mm -hmm. Same exact conversation, just different stuff. And then in, the, in, 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 in 2000 and 2005 and 2010 and 2015, the same exact conversation about these young kids that don't know what they're doing and they're trying to make us and they don't know. Yeah, it hasn't changed. It hasn't. It really hasn't. Ghosting? You know what ghosting is? That's not mean. That's laziness. <laughs> That's all it is. Yeah. My kid does not ghost anybody. The people she hates, she spends more time texting, <laughs> which is, I don't really understand. I thought you kid ghost, you know. Don't like that kid. Just ghost them. No, they're lazy. They texted you. You answered the question. They texted 50 people. And then they got 50 responses and they didn't know what to do. So they went, ah, I don't know. Go so the you fix one. ghosting is you call them and then you call them again until call them again until they go, oh, can you quit calling me? Okay. That's, that wasn't any different back in the eighties. Mm -hmm. It's just that we've given it different names and we, we think it's scarier because we think these kids, these kids today. And that's just, that's us doing that to ourselves. I think that's, and then that's my opinion. Anyway, and I apologize if I railroaded the conversation. No, that's, that's, you didn't. No, not at all. That's that's, right. You made a great point. There's two things I want to I want to kind of jump uh, or hit hit um, the the uh, how sales have the people have been kind of reducing their rates because of that fear, and I want to dig into that a little bit 
if that's something that's a DJ side thing where DJs have just just done that, or is it something that clients today are pushing harder to get a better deal or a reduced rate looking for that? I don't think that people are asking in any more than they've always have. I don't. I think that we got some people to ask and then we freaked out just like we did back in the day. You know, I think this is, once again, it's not a new phenomenon. You know, we, we had an entire year of nothing. So of course we're terrified <laughs> mm -hmm. and we got all this inventory. Holy crap. Fire sale. Let's get it sold. Oh dear God. Yeah. We're not the only ones that are doing that. Grocery stores are doing this and, 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 and clothing stores are doing this and, you know, Target is doing this. Okay. So we can, I don't think that, I don't think a DJ who wants to start discounting his prices, I don't feel badly. I don't, I don't think he's wrong. I, I just feel bad that he thinks he has to. Um, I'm the, you know, I'm the, I'm the lit. I think I should be the Lipman test because I'm the guy who's charging more than anybody else. And I haven't dropped my prices and people are still buying. You know, John, I have to, calls, that's all. Yeah, I, I, I haven't even had that question asked, yeah. and I, I think part of that is because, again, so many have postponed their wedding from 2020 to over to 21, that now the pool is a little bit smaller, and I think sometimes people are just happy to find a banquet hall that's open, a DJ that's available, a photographer that, that can help them out. I, I just haven't seen the whole price question from my perspective here locally. I haven't seen that. Uh, pop up probably since I mean since I began getting calls again before Christmas. Well, I think it shows up when they've heard from another person. You know, there's a there's a vendor out there that's freaked out and they say, well, you know, I know that things are difficult right now because they're afraid. Mm -hmm. And they say, well, what we've done is we've started discounting prices because we want to bring people in again. They're like, oh wow, people are starting to discount. So you get a call and then hey, you know, my my photographer gave me a discount. Is that something you guys are doing too? Well, yeah, of course they're going to ask. I would too. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, but it's still just a question that can get a yes or a no. I've never bought a car when he said it's going to be $25,000. And I went, okay, here's the money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I always say, really? That's the best you can do? Yeah. Really? Uh, I, I got $19,000. let us see what you can do. That doesn't mean I disrespect him or have no care for his product or none of that. I just want a discount. And and the car dealers I usually buy from are the ones are the ones that say no you know I actually came you with you with the price that was the the price, that's the price. Oh, that's the guy I'm going to buy from. If he's dancing with me, it's because he tried to oversell me anyway, mm -hmm. right? At, at least that's my experience of it. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that there are. I think there are people out there because they're afraid that because over the last year. We've all, and many of us, many, especially full timers right now, we went into the crapper. Not only did we, our business go to hell in a handbasket, but we had to start we, every bit of my, my slush fund, which you, you know, be sure you have a good two months of flush, slush, slush fund. Yeah. I had eight months <laughs> and it's gone. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, I'm scared. You know, when I'm starting to consider what's it going to cost if I refinance my house again, just to pay bills when I'm starting to go through my, 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 my retirement fund. And I look at the system I had for that and it looks like it's, it's, it's gone. It's like that system was wrong. Now what am I going to do? I know I'm back in, I'm scared. I just need to get money in. I go back to the years when I first began, which is like, I'll do anything for any amount of money because I need cash flow. I need reputation. I need cash flow. If I'm not doing work, I don't have reputation running around the city. The reputation around the city isn't out there because I'm not working. Okay. One year of not working can make your reputation go, who is that guy? You know, I literally, if I don't get five calls out of every wedding, because I don't spend money in big marketing, I don't have a big ad in the local wedding magazine because I can't afford to. I'm Regardless of what I charge, I'm still, that's too big of an investment for my company. And, it, and it's too little of my of, of return on investment. So I need to spend it in different ways. And now even that went out the crapper because people, no matter how many of those people I reached back out to, they're still, well, yeah, no, I know, but I'm not doing anything because uh, we're afraid of, you know, the, the end of the world and we're, you know, we're going to end up being zombies and eating human flesh and we don't want to leave our house. 
So I really don't even want to have the conversation right now, Bill. Can we just wait? Yeah, I, yeah, we can because, of course, I'm actually scared too. In the meantime, what they don't understand is that we're going broke. And as we go broke, we get scared, really scared. And that's, that's the thing that, you know, I don't have a problem with those guys that are discounting. I actually feel really bad that they think they have to or that they actually have to. But most of the guys that I know that went out and they said, okay, well, I haven't had work for the last eight months. I better discount my price by half. Did not immediately start booking any gigs. Mm -hmm. Most of them didn't book gigs at all. And they were giving it away for half off. So it wasn't the price. It's not the price. It's people are scared of what might happen tomorrow. People are, the, the, I did, what, two weddings this year? And both of them were worried that people just wouldn't show up. Not the money they were spending. They were worried that their grandparents were like, you know, we love you and all. And I know you spent twenty five, thirty five, forty five thousand dollars on this wedding, but oh, wow, we're not leaving our house. I know you spent, you know, eighty dollars a plate on this meal, but yeah, man, we're afraid. And that's that's something that none of us thought we were gonna have to deal with, especially our clients. And they're just it's just I, I don't I don't think there's a a way to deal with this. I don't think there's a, a, a way to figure it out. I think we need to continue to move forward and we need to be sensitive to people's fears and care about them so that when they start feeling better, that you're the guy they want to work with. Because you didn't just go, oh, come on, man. Can, can't you see I'm just going broke here? Don't do this to me. Those guys aren't going to get a lot of work afterwards because that's going to be remembered. And it's not bad. It's just the way they're reacting because we're just as a frightened or probably more frightened. Nobody understands. Nobody understands that the event industry went in the toilet first and we will be the last ones to climb out of the bowl. Yeah. Absolutely last. And no one understands. My parents don't get that. My parents have zero idea why I'm not, I don't have money to come and visit them. <laughs> I tell them how, how little money I have. And they're like, that can't be right. Mom, Dad, you just don't get, you know, people are scared. And yeah, I haven't worked for a year. <laughs> what? How, how is it you haven't worked for a year? You're really good. I know I'm really good, Mom. Thanks. That's nice of you, but it has nothing to do with whether I'm good or not. Mm -hmm. Okay. These people really, this is the zombie apocalypse, man. It really is. For the, for the hospital. People are reacting to it like it is. Everything except for eating each other. That's what's happening. <laughs> well, I think, I mean, I don't know if it's incumbent upon our industry, but I mean, we, I think we have to play a little bit more of a positive card here for people. I mean, cases are going down. We have a third vaccine out now. States are relaxing a lot. I did, I believe I just saw New York. Was it New York that, uh, John, that just opened up weddings again? Yeah, there's been a few. Quite, yeah, the, yeah, there, yeah, so, yeah. I mean... I think if we can, if we can put that positive spin, I yeah, think. I think you're right. Yeah. At the same yeah. time, I think we need to, we need, we still need to be, we need to be real, re realistic, that the positive spin and the opening of up of, of things could, I mean, everything could go to hell in an biscuit overnight. We we need to go forward as if it's not, but we also need to be realistic as business people to know that there may be a huge slide back, slide back. And if we don't, if we aren't w ready for the huge slide back of another six months to a year, I think you're doing yourself a disservice. I think I really do. I, God forbid, I don't want it to happen. Um, I want to start and working as quickly as the next guy. But, you know, I think uh, for us to move forward as if that might not happen at all, I think that's just being naive. Um, I think there's going to be some bounce backs. I think there's going to be some frightened states. I think there's going to be some some knee-jerk reactions over small or big things that are going to happen over the next six months because a shot in the arm doesn't stop it. A shot in the arm in a year. You know, right? Polio wasn't done the day they started giving people shots. It was over a couple of years. And polio was bigger than this. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be... There's going to be scary things that are going to happen. There's going to be all these articles, like we were saying. People, you know, write this article about this news story about a 
wedding in our your backyard and it, it didn't help and oh my gosh everybody two grandmothers died and that story is going to be the norm mm-hmm. it's going to be like that has happened at all the weddings instead of about the one so we're going to have that we need to know that that's going to happen and yeah we need to stay positive but we, i think we also are doing them a disservice we are, are, aren't also realistic and be unafraid to say you know i'm being positive i'm going forward with you I'm ready to rock, but I also, we also need to be realistic enough to have the conversation so that we aren't, we don't feel like what in the hell when it does happen or rather if it does happen. And that's the conversations I'm having with those people in June and July and August is I want them all to happen, but I also don't want them to call me shocked (laughs) that it did. You know, I want them to be, if they're going to keep inching forward and taking those chances, I want them to, know that it's inching forward instead of moving forward like it's never going to it's everything is fixed that's bad for business i think i really do because everything is fixed and then a big slap in the face backs us up by another six months to eight months i think so that realistic conversation of let's be cool let's be smart we'll move forward but let's you know we now know we still just have to be smart and care and keep our eyes open and know that we're still moving forward, even though there's a, there's something scary. Um, and I think a big part I, of, of all the, the things you're talking about is the part of that is that communication and, and that communication yeah, that. needed to, needed, needs to start really early on in that conversation when they're asking for price, asking for availability and, and developing that relationship. And I think that's one thing that, too many are, are going to forget in the, the, you know, getting back to the title of the show tonight, uh, you know, I forgot how to sell, is that was part of the the method of operation for most of us over the last five years, is we were having a conversation or struggling to get to that conversation point. Mm-hmm. And now we've gotten away from that and we're not used to it. And yet that's the critical component that's going to be needed to be able to be help them be successful with whatever they end up doing for their wedding day. Whether that's right, well, next because month. Because they're just as frightened as the client. It, it precisely. They're like, oh, everything's changed. I better go back to being afraid as opposed to, I had, this is the way that worked. It still works. It's just scary. You didn't forget how to sell. You just think that the selling has changed because the world has changed. The, 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 you know, the conversation, the empathy, you know, that you can have for the people that are worried, that might have changed. You may have to have, look at it from a different perspective that you weren't looking at it from before. Because, I mean, we had a lot of years of doing this the same way and looking at it the same way, knowing, being able to predict what people are thinking as they come in. But if you go back to when we first started doing it, we didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> so why don't we just go back to way, you know, because we aren't, and why not just start thinking of it like that again? And uh, many, you I don't think you do. Doing. So then just be, ask the right questions, be empathetic, you know, uh, listen for what matters, what really, really matters. And that muscle will be built up again. Um, Because that's, I think that's the only way forward. Or, you know, we can be terrified enough to say, well, maybe we should just get the hell out. And I don't think that's really what people should be doing. It's just, we're mad. Part of it too. It's like, I had this crap to get, I had this down. I knew what I was doing. I had my system. I got up every day. I did the same thing. I was in the same stuff. I talked to all of my clients this way. Everything. I mean, they, it's like the etch sketched our entire business plan. Kind of. At least it feels that way. At times. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Gentlemen, we need got to wrap up here uh, so we can switch for the next show. Uh, Mike, Bill, thank you guys for being on tonight and, and sharing your your thoughts and passion for our industry. And thank you guys for being with us this evening. We're going to take about a nine minute break and then MJ and Dan and I will be back talking about DJ software tonight, which is one of Bill Herman's favorite topics. It is. I talk about it all the time on my podcast called the creative license. You can hear every Monday on DJ and TV every Monday morning. It hits about 6am. Thank you guys once again. And we'll be back in about 10. Thank you.